I want to read to you this morning about a Medal of Honor recipient. Wayne M. W. Karen. Hospital Corpsman, third class. He was in Vietnam. His citation reads, For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity, at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty while serving in his platoon corpsman with Company K during the combat operations against enemy forces. While on a sweep through an open rice field, Hospital Corpsman Karen's unit started receiving enemy small arms fire. Upon seeing two Marine casualties fall, he immediately ran forward to render first aid, but found they were dead. At this time, the platoon was taken under intense small arms and automatic weapons fire, sustaining additional casualties. As he moved to aid of his wounded comrades, Hospital Corpsman Karen was hit in the arm by enemy fire. Although knocked to the ground, he regained his feet and continued to the injured Marines. He, he rendered medical assistance to the first Marine he reached, who was grievously wounded and undoubtedly was instrumental in saving the man's life. Hospital Corpsman Karen then ran toward the second wounded Marine, but was again hit by enemy fire, this time in the leg. Nonetheless, he crawled to the remaining distance and provided medical aid for this severely wounded man. Hospital Corpsman Karen started to make his way to yet another injured comrade when he was again struck by enemy small arms fire. Courageously and with unbelievable determination, Hospital Corpsman Karen continued his attempt to reach the third Marine until he was killed in an enemy rocket round. His inspiring valor, steadfast determination, and selfless dedication in the face of extreme danger sustained and enhanced the finest traditions of the United States Naval Service. He was buried in Arlington National Cemetery. This Medal of Honor citation was given after Petty Officers Karen's final breath on the earth and represents the countless witnesses to his commitment to the United States, his love for his brother in arms, and keeping the oath he gave to his country. This citation is a testimony for a Memorial Day and to every Memorial Day to come. Amen. The reason I read that particular one is it's close to me. Uh, see, I was stationed aboard a ship called the USS Karen. It was in his namesake. The crazy thing is, is with all the history about what Petty Officer Karen did, nothing mattered of what his life was like before then. It only mattered what he did when he was called. He is a Medal of Honor recipient because of the courage commitment to his country, to fulfilling the oath he took, and to the love he had for his brother. Apostle Paul's testimony for a memorial is forever recorded as well. Uh, in Sunday school, the brother read it this morning and I kind of laughed about it. But uh, it says, 2 Timothy 4, verse 7 and 8. Concerning the Apostle Paul, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which is the Lord. 
which is the Lord. The righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not me only, but into all of the also that love his appearing. Amen. Paul got saved, and he took an oath for God. He took the charge that God gave him for his life. And he was willing to lay down his life for the others that were around him. That is a medal of honor. Amen. That is why we have Memorial Day. It's for those that came before us that led the way and gave, in many cases, and in all cases, the ultimate sacrifice. I was thankful that I was able to go to Normandy uh, a few years ago. And of course, they showed it on the screen above, that looking over the Atlantic Ocean of the famous place where, uh, in World War II, where they came ashore and the tens of thousand men that died there. You know, it, it didn't uh, prepare for me what I would actually see. That should kind of go to your hearts to understand that we only know in part now the blessings and what God has for us. But when we see him, it'll be overwhelming. I can tell you when I went to that memorial site, I had to stop. I just cried. They were the heroes. When you read about the Apostle Paul, he is a hero. To those that go before us, on a lighter note, I think of Billy Graham. And you really have to understand the medal of the man. He did over 400 crusades in his lifetime. That, that's a lot. In 185 countries. What is recorded and documented is, is the ones that came to accept the gospel. They, you know, how did you make a decision for the Lord today? And they put a check in that block. Imagine all of the ones that never came forward but accepted Jesus Christ. Billy Graham had an oath that he had under the Lord. He reached over 213 million people with the gospel. You can say what you think about him, but his heart was on one direction. You can imagine and understand why at his memorial, you know, he didn't say what the people wanted to hear. He said what the people needed to hear. Amen. You would think that, uh, that, you know, he was popular because uh, he said God loves you. He wasn't popular when he said you're a sinner and you're sinning and need to turn unto God. But his convictions and, and the righteousness of God in him led him to tell the truth even when they didn't want to hear it. It's documented over 2.2 million people came to know the Lord through his ministry and his preaching. There were 13,000 people in, a, in just a few days that walked by his casket that came from everywhere. They had to limit his funeral to 2,000 because that's what the church could hold. And so you could only go to the funeral by personal invitation. Now that is the people's memorial to Billy Graham. Imagine what God's memorial to him is. Do you think that he said, well done, my good and faithful servant? I do. As he said as well to Paul. And you can imagine being there when the family of Mr. Karen, Petty Officer Karen, went to the White House. What can you say except read the testimonies of the men 
that observed his valiant effort, his courage, his willing to honor his oath even in dying. They didn't say, I would imagine, I'm sorry for your loss as much as they thanked him for what they gained. He was a mantle to the military, just like all the Medal of Honor winners that have died, or those that came aboard the lands, uh, aboard the beaches in Normandy, or those that were in all the foreign wars throughout, for those that were in the first Iraq war, the second Iraq war, Afghanistan, Vietnam, Korea, going all the way back to the Civil War. When your conviction and your faith and your belief in something is so great, you will step out. Amen. And you, you will be honored for that. Don't, not necessarily an honor that you get here, but certainly up there. Amen. Woo. <clears throat> As I approach the message now, <coughs> consider how you will be remembered in the Lord's eyes. Because that's really all that matters. Amen. I am thankful that we had the testimony of the people over Billy Graham. I am thankful that God carried the testimony of Paul in the scripture so that we would know. And oh, by the way, he was the chiefest of sinners, yet God elevated him and he served God faithfully. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 2. I'll start in verse 1. Now the days of David drew nigh that he would die, should die. And he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. <laughs> I like that. You know, if anyone knows me, I like a hard handshake. I, I like a man to be a man and a woman to be a woman. Amen. There's nothing greater than that. David. Verse 3, and keep the charge of the Lord thy God, to what? To walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself, that the Lord may continue his word which he spoke concerning me, saying, If thy children take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth with all their hearts and with all their souls and, there, sh and th there shall not fail thee a man on the throne of Israel. Moreover thou knowest also what Joab the son of Zeruiah did to me and what he did to the two captains of the host of Israel unto Abner the son of Ner and unto uh, Emmaesah the son of uh, Jether, whom he slew and shed the blood of war in peace and put the blood of war upon his girdle uh, that was about his loins and in his shoes that were on his feet. Do therefore according to thy wisdom and let not his forehead go down to the grave in peace, but show kindness in, unto the sons of Bezirliah, the Gileadite, uh, and let them be of those that eat as, at thy table, for they came to me when I fled because of Absalom thy brother. And behold, thou hast with thee uh, Shimei, the son of uh, Gira, a Benjamite of Behurim, uh, which cursed me with a grievous curse in the day when I went to Maenaim, uh, but he came down to meet me at Jordan, and I swear to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put thee to death with the sword. Now therefore, 
hold him not guiltless, for thou art a wise man, and knowest that thou oughtest to do unto him. But his hoar head being thou down to the grave with blood. So, David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just ask for your guidance this morning. That our hearts be open, Lord, that we would walk out of here changed. Lord, I just pray for change. That we would grasp to you and strive to you to live our lives more abundantly unto what you intended us to be, Lord. That we can go forward and be remembered by you. In your name, amen. David had a lot of faults here in his life. But no one can question whether he loved the Lord. You know, you can love the Lord in sin. You can make mistakes and be forgiven. That's what we're thankful for. I started out by telling you, we don't know all the things of Karen's life before the day of his medal, uh, when his courage was on the battlefield. We don't, you know what? It doesn't matter. It's what he did then to the end. And what mattered now, as a father in his dying breaths, on his last days, he wants to give some godly advice to his son to leave him with. And so what David is doing here, he is preceding Solomon's life, trying to give him a testimony of principles that will ultimately continue the kingdom and the heirs if they will adhere to it and there will be a memorial forever of it. Now unfortunately while they didn't apply to all the principles, Solomon didn't, eventually there were many kings after that 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 did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And there were many that did not. They did not adhere to the principles. The reason I chose this passage this morning, if you ask yourself, what would... How would I be remembered by the Lord if tomorrow was the last day? Would he say, well done, my good and faithful son? I, I'm not here for conviction this morning. I'm here for his encouragement. Because God can start anew every day. At every moment. The devil would have you to think, I've made too many mistakes. I can't go on. Be beat down. God says, just come unto me. All ye that are heavy and laden with burden in your life. The devil doesn't want you to say anything for him. So David here gives some principles and he lays them out. If you want to have success, if you want to be honored in a memorial by God when you come to the other end, these are the things, David, that you need to adhere to. Even in spite of his own sin, his own mistakes, it behooves every father to tell his child when he is late in his life, when he is about to pass. Sometimes it can have the greatest impact. You know, children, they don't want to listen to their moms and dads typically as well. But I can tell you, I listen to my dad on his deathbed. There may have been conflicts with my father at times during our lives. But I was going to give him the time of day at the end because it's when you're at the end that you understand what is most important. And so now as we look at this, 
I want to take some time and I want to consider your own memorial and reflect on the key principles that you want to have as part of your memorial. You want to be influenced by God for the memorial that you want your children to remember and you want to pass on to them. The first thing that you want to remember and have your memorial reflect is of a commitment unto the Lord. That's the most important thing. It starts always with a commitment. Ironically, you see here down here, you look down in verse 3. He says, And keep the charge of the Lord thy God. Keep the charge. You know, the first thing that comes to mind when I hear that is if any of you have been in the military, I, I retired from the military. I know there are many in here. But you, when you stand a watch, you stand a post, you're given instruction. You're given uh, some um, general military orders. And as a matter of fact, they have tent for standing a watch. Stand my post in a military manner, allowing no one to pass without proper authority is one of them. But that's the charge to the watchstander in order to be successful. And you have to be committed to that charge. It will save you. If you follow the rules, it will save you. It will make you successful. You know, in the passage here, to keep the charge means to preserve, to watch over, to guard concretely. You know what that means? Unmovingly. To stand the post. So the question here, talking about commitment unto the Lord, is to, to do what? So I've got my general orders. What am I protecting? What am I standing watch over? Look here what he says. He says, and keep the charge in verse 3 of the Lord thy God to walk first in his ways. To walk in his ways. He, he defines what those ways are. Look back here. He says, in his ways. To keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies as is it is written in the law of Moses. Talking of that time, he was inclusive of every guidance that God had given. And he's saying here, be committed unto the Lord to keep the charges of his word. To know it. To walk in the way of it. The way of the Lord. You know the way of the Lord is not our way. His righteousness is not our righteousness. What is acceptable unto God is apart from what's acceptable unto man. His way. He is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. His direction. That's what he's saying here. He says to walk in his ways. You notice that it's the direction, it's the movement, it's going forward. If you want to be successful, you need to be committed to walking the direction and how God wants you to go. Not how you need to go. Not how you think. I know it's a tough thing to understand. Do you think that Brother Karen there, when he was out and had taken the oath and he was with his men, do you think it, to do what he did was his own thought? Oh, I know. Some of you are saying, I'm the toughest guy that's ever been around. There was something greater than himself. That's why he was given the medal. What Paul did was something greater than himself. Billy Graham, can you imagine? It was bigger than himself. It was God's way. So when you walk in the way, you're walking in God's way. 
The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Remember what I said a few minutes ago? Righteousness is God's righteousness, not ours. It's what's acceptable unto God. Not what is acceptable unto, unto man. It's a tough thing sometimes. You've got to be committed. It comes by looking under the scriptures and knowing him. Know his way. Praying and seeking God's guidance. When you do that, you will then start to connect and, and be committed to what God intended you to be. You can overcome all of the challenges. Paul was beaten numerous times. Yet he kept moving forward. Because he knew that God's way was the right way. When, devil, when God opens a door, I guarantee you the devil's going to tell you that door should be shut again. It's the wrong door. Man's way will always be in opposition. Search out Proverbs chapter 28. And find out a lot about the righteousness of man, which is wicked, whereas the righteousness of God is honor. Turn over to Romans chapter 15. Keep your finger there. We'll be coming back to it. Romans 15. <clears throat> Look down at verse... How did I get the wrong verse in there? Oh, that's because I'm not in Romans. I need a new Bible. Romans 15. I'm going to start in, in verse uh, 3, but I'm going to read 4. For even Christ pleads not himself, but as it is written, he reproaches of them that reproach thee, fell on me. For whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning, that through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. You know, there's nothing... When people start walking that mountain path, a lot of the time is, is they're encouraged on the path because they know where the path will go. Uh, you don't start out on a trip, generally speaking, uh, not knowing where you're going because it's uncomfortable. Commitment and confidence come when you know where you're going. You know what you're reading about here is you know you have your hope in Jesus Christ. It's not a question of when he's coming back. Or whether he's coming back, it's when he's coming back. You're looking forward to the hope of your salvation that's down his way. His way. Not our own. Secondly, look at verse 4. You have a walk in his way. And in verse 4, The Lord may continue his word which he spake concerning me, saying, If thy children take heed to their way to walk before me in truth. Walk in his truth. He's given a guidance here. And at first, you know, I didn't quite understand it. But the key essence here that he says, he says, if thy children take heed to their way to walk. If they're trustworthy, if they continue. Put it this way. To walk in his truth is to carry the mantle. 
You can imagine how proud the Lord is when he looks down, his son who's grabbed the scripture, he's committed to walking the way of God, and he walks forward representing God. Have you ever heard of an ambassador? You're an ambassador for Christ. Every day you walk in his truth if you are a true ambassador. You represent the Lord in heaven. What you say is what he's told you to say. What you're authorized to do is what God commands and directs you to do. It is his righteousness, not yours. That's the truth. That's being committed to walk in the truth. That's being committed to walk the path his way. That's what committing means. That's what medals are all about. That's what awards are all about. When you start taking self aside and putting him first. Thirdly, that same walk in his truth, it also reflects a walk in his firmness. His firmness. I go back to the, the one thing that stuck with me when I was studying this was in keeping the charge because all of these walks that he's talking about here are charges. But the thing is, is that concrete. What does that really mean when you think of firmness as concrete? Oh, man. The storms will blow. The challenges will come. I have studied the scriptures, one would say, for reproof, conviction, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And I can overcome the challenges that come my way. Uh, I forget who the singer was that talked about the storms. It's one of my favorite songs, but sometimes when you're up here, this, you forget them a little bit. But the truth is, you can know when you're walking his way and you're committed, nothing. Be firm. David told his son, stay in the scriptures, stay to the law, be committed to to what God has given us. Stand firm in it. And above all, when other people look at you, they see the mantle of God in your kingship. Because if you'll do that, God will bless your children and their children's children. He said, Solomon, be committed to God in everything that you do. Be committed unto the Lord. Not only that, be committed unto His righteousness. His righteousness. That's the thing. You can stir it all up. The thing I draw it out about His righteousness because David's mistakes he made in his life were when he didn't look to God's righteousness, which he learned of him through personal prayer discussions with God, which he learned through the law of Moses. Moses uh, God gave some very specific, if this happens, do this. If this happens, do this. Thy word is written in thy heart now. That we might not sin against God, is it not? It's a good thing to memorize scripture. Absolutely. But here, we want to be reflected in our memorial because we had cloaked on us his righteousness. It comes out in many ways. The first one is discernment. Decisions that are made along your path. 
Well, how do you get that out of that? Because David here is making right some wrongs. Because of lack of discernment, where he let the flesh make decisions along his path. And now he knows those have to be corrected. And so he's asking his son, after he's gone, to make those corrections. There's something about being a king. It's tough when you go back and renege on your word. Imagine God in heaven. If he told you and gave you a promise, then he reneged on it. What kind of father in heaven would we have? God keeps all his promises. A king that's worth his weight will always keep his promises. But here, discernment. He's telling his son to maintain God's righteousness in your lives because it'll pay off in your discernment first. Look down at our passage here in verse 5. Moreover, thou knowest also what Joab the son he did to me and what he did to the two captains of the host of Israel. He's talking about Abner and, uh, and uh, Amasa. These are they're two separate moments, but they were both murdered by Joab. Joab was one of the most precious men unto the king. If you read throughout the entire story of David, Joab's always there. He's his right-hand man. Sometimes it's hard to say or do what needs to be done because you love the guy. In both murders that they talk about here, the first one, uh, talking of Abner, he comes in with the shake of deception and, and he comes into the room and he's, uh, he has the appearance of peace and then slays him. You see... The law of Moses says that that's against the law. And what should have happened to Joab is he should have been put to death. But sometimes, you know, self gets in it. Oh, but I love Joab. What would I do if I don't have Joab at my side? I can't do that. Sometimes we put up a blinder to it. Happened a second time with the other gentleman. And he was a bloodkin. These are heavy on David's heart. And he, and in essence, he's telling Solomon, be in God's righteousness and discern properly according to God. And he leaves it to Solomon to right the wrong for his failure to follow the law of Moses. I thank God that we have the opportunity at any t moment to correct a right or wrong with a right. There's nothing you can do that God can't forgive you from. But it's important that we get in the scripture and that we're convicted by God to, to recognize those. God gives us discernment. We've been going through the book of Proverbs forever. And I'll tell you what, it cuts uh, like a six-bladed knife. I feel like I can't do anything right. Everything I do, it's convicting. But I'm trying to listen to God. Let your memorial reflect a commitment to the Lord. His righteousness, number one, is discernment. And secondly, His righteousness when it comes to love and kindness. Love and kindness. If you are going to be committed and you're going to carry the mantle and be an ambassador for God, first you need to have God's discernment in your life. Secondly, that righteousness of God needs to show His love and kindness. It's important. If you want to be remembered, say, man, I remember uh, Mrs. Jan. You know, you could tell she loved the Lord and she would do anything to help people. She gave the gospel out to her detriment. Never forget. Verse 7 is a unique one. But show kindness unto sons 
of Barzillia, uh, the Gileadite, and to them that, uh, of those that eat at the table, for they came to me when I fled because of Absalom, thy brother. You know, Absalom, uh, the, the, the key thing there is Absalom was trying to overthrow the throne. He had to run across the Jordan and get out of town. He got cussed out by another gentleman over there, which I didn't even have time to go into. Uh, and th that guy that he cussed out, uh, uh, let's see, uh, I want to read it for you though. And behold, verse 8, and behold that thou hast with thee Shimei, the son of uh, Gera, a Benjamite of Beharum. Uh, so when he was leaving, Absalom was uh, on the tell and he had to get out real quick. Uh, there was a man that cursed him out, this gentleman. And according to the law of Moses, he should have done something about it. And, and his right hand man said, hey, let me run over there, that guy that's cursing you out, and let me put him to the sword. Do what is right. And he said, hey, it doesn't at the time, David said, it doesn't matter. He was in fear. It doesn't matter right now. We just need to get out of here. So when he finally comes back, Absalom is put down, and he comes back, and he's about to come over. That gentleman knows what the law says. And so he's standing there at the banks, and he says, forgive me. I'm sorry for cursing you out. And instead of discernment doing what was right by the law, he forgave him. He makes right on that one. You know what he tells Solomon to do? I can't go back on my oath because it was a promise. Remember kings? Remember God? But aren't you thankful God doesn't go back on his promises? Yeah. <laughs> That's a blessing. I know I need it. But he tells him here, Solomon, you take care of doing right. But I did wrong. It's a clean slate when you step into the job. But here... This loving kindness, you got one guy cursing, you got another guy that just opens up the door and says, let me usher you across the water. And David is taken aback by that love and that kindness of that man. And he says, you know, come with me. Bring, come with me. Sit at my table. Be there with me. And he says, I, I got to go home. But my sons, if you would take the same love and promise on my sons he says I promise you for what you have done this day I will forever be in the honor to do what is right with you in his dying breath that same love and kindness that God has given him through his righteousness through his word being committed unto him he passes on to his son in a demonstration of love. You know, you have to be forgiving. Solomon's going to be the wisest man on the earth, and being wise sometimes can get you in trouble. You're so wise that you don't forgive anyone for mistakes. All you do is say, no, nope, you're wrong. No, nope, you're wrong. No, nope. I've met people like that. It's horrible to be around sometimes. Can't you say anything nice? You know, I know I'm wrong, but can you forgive me for a moment? Man, when you get a hold, love thy neighbor as thyself. That is the law of Jesus Christ that's written on the hearts of men. Let your memorial reflect that you had love and kindness for God to all the people. You don't want to be remembered by people on this earth as being the person who is angry and mean and detrimental. Man, when you get caught up in the world, that's what comes out. Let your memorial reflect being committed unto the Lord. Let it reflect His righteousness, His love. Let it reflect being an ambassador who makes good discernment and choices and decisions, not on what you want, but what God is directing. At least you could be like David when you've made wrong discernments and correct them. Finally, 
The third point, let your memorial reflect his example of promise keeping. The greatest thing that you could probably ever do as a father is be consistent. The hardest thing to ever do as a father is to be consistent. Consistent goes a long way in promises. When you promise someone, it means that they can rely upon what you have said and can adjust accordingly because of the promise you gave them. God has given his promises from the beginning. You note that the reliance here, the reliance here in, in verse 4, he says, that the Lord may continue his word which he spake concerning me, the promise, his word. If thy children take heed to their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, and with, uh, there shall not fail thee a man on the throne of Israel. Turn over to uh, Psalms 132. And we're about done. Psalms 132. Verse 10. 132. For thy servant David's sake, turn not away thy face and thine anointed. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon the throne. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimonies. Remember we talked about the ways. And my testimony that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon the throne forevermore. I can tell you right now. God has made a promise that if you will seek him. Look above, not down. You will follow him. Being a fisher of men. Having love and kindness. That you will have joy in your life. And you will have the hope of your salvation over and over on a daily basis. God promises that he will never violate that. But here's the second side of that coin as a believer. Someday when you go to be with the Lord. He will know whether you were a person. Who stayed true to promises. Just like the people that will attend your funeral or memorial, they will look to see, they will remember whether you were a person they could count on. God is looking for faithful men and women that will keep the promises of God, that will represent Him and carry the mantle, be an ambassador for Him. I go back to the question I did at the beginning. We looked at this man, Karen. We looked at Billy Graham. We looked at Paul. The only person we haven't looked at is ourselves. And how we will be remembered and what God will think when we go to be with him. Will there be this wonderful memorial of honor, courage, and commitment? Or will it be something less than that? You've accepted Jesus Christ. He forgives everything. I'm still struggling, struggling to get my testimony right. So that my children will have the best laid plans of how I live for God. I'm, I'm struggling that. But I'm trying and I'm praying that you try as well. It's an ongoing battle in our lives. Man, if I didn't have the flesh, it would be a lot easier, wouldn't it? <laughs> what will your memorial be like? Wouldn't it be great 
if he got to heaven and you stood before the Lord and he came forward like so many military guys have seen in their lifetime. And God stands up and you're standing in front of him and he puts the medal over your shoulders. That is a blessing. Look at, we're already gaining treasures in heaven every time we're committed unto him. Every time we have his righteousness in our lives. Every time we keep the promises of God in our lives. We're always building treasures in heaven. But someday, we'll go to be with him. And someday, I pray that he too would take that medal and put that over your shoulders. And say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Memorial. It can be a great thing. All you got to do is start. And it, it can start right now. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're at in your life, how old you are, how young you are. And there'll be bumps along the road and you'll get back on them. But you're building that memorial. David's a good example of that. 